advocating for artificial intelligence. This is part of the discussion on Europe going digital, on the world going digital uh, here at the European uh, Business Summit. How do you develop artificial intelligence, AI, uh, while ensuring uh, ethics and human rights? How do you encourage that development um, and, and, ha and set ethical guidelines without killing the golden goose that, that, that is innovating? Uh, or maybe that gold, golden goose might go somewhere else. That's, that's the key issue there, too. So we want to talk to uh, someone in the European Parliament and also a, a Project Sherpa. Project Sherpa is called Shaping the Ethical Dimensions of Smart Information uh, Systems. Uh, let's bring on the two guests, uh, Eva Kaili, MEP uh, of S&D, Socialists and Democrats. Uh, Eva, you are on the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age, uh, termed uh, called, called AIDA. Uh, and also uh, with us is Belt Stahl, who is uh, Sherpa coordinator. Now Sherpa, uh, Sherpa stands uh, for Sherpa stands for shaping the ethical dimensions of smart information systems. Uh, that was established in 2018. Uh, it includes academia, industry, civil society, standard bodies, standards bodies, and ethic, ethics committees. Uh, as Eva is on, so it's very interesting to get input from from both of you. Uh, and knowing in the context that the European Parliament has approved uh, a number of uh, proposals that were proposed initially by, uh, by Sherpa, and, uh, and those uh, include on, uh, on liability, um, on uh, property rights, uh, on ethics, uh, and then the European Commission is supposed to make its proposal uh, early uh, next year. So that is the process. That's what we're looking at right now, and it's good to have Sherpa and a member of uh, that uh, special committee in the parliament to talk about this. Let me start with, uh, with Eva. Uh, Eva, um, uh, one of the proposals by Sherpa, and which you've taken up on at this, in this special committee, is how to develop a regulatory framework and enforcement mechanisms uh, for AI. Uh, how do you do that? Well, without killing the golden goose, as I said. Thank you for, uh, for having me organizing this very uh, interesting discussion. So um, the main problem of Europe is that at this point, we already have a fr fragmented regulatory landscape. So it, it has to happen in any case. So before we start being concerned about what happens next, first we have to set up uh, the regulation that would take down the barriers between the European member states. And um, this is crucial because we need to fulfill a digital single market uh, because uh, companies that uh, uh, start up here, they usually find markets like China okay. and US allowing for them access to data or like one market with like one legal and tax system that would make it more easy for them to, um, to expand. So um, uh, the European Commission, the Parliament and the Council, we are trying to address that during the legislative period that we are uh, now going through, especially under the light of the pandemic. And um, we have several files coming up. Besides the initiatives and the opinions, we have legislative yeah. work that's coming up. Right. <clears throat> you had a, a committee meeting uh, last week. Uh, can you give us any news on that, any new developments out of that committee, the, the special committee? So um, the idea that the special committee is actually trying to coordinate our work and our common position as Europeans beyond parties and committees, because AI is too broad in order to be covered by one special committee. So what we try to do is like to set the roadmap to understand the national strategies and to be able to fill all the, the missing pieces. So um, we have some we had some hearings uh, uh, already on, on different aspects that could be transformed in, in our lives, like okay. the, the labor rights, the trade. And uh, we will keep going like that until we have we cover any aspect that would be transformed in order to provide MEPs with like um, scientific data and understanding of how we should proceed with the legislation that's upcoming. And I'm also running the Center for AI, which is under the think yeah. tank of the European Parliament. And there we have already done several uh, pieces of like research and studies and workshops. And I think we have uh, quite, um, we have quite developed our, our understanding on how we should uh, proceed. And one of the things that we agreed also in the special committee is to collaborate globally. Mm -hmm. um, let's say, first of all, with OECD in order to agree on stuff that actually could work beyond EU, not only inside the European Union. Yeah, OECD being the, the major industrialized countries of the world. Um, one other question before I go to Bernd is, 
another proposal which I believe you support is establishing an agency, a European agency for AI. What would that do? And, and don't we have enough agencies? Well, actually, we don't have in Europe is a body where we can coordinate and harmonize a bit the environment, so to provide clear understanding, uh, clear to the European Parliament, the Commission for amendments that are necessary, uh, but also that can uh, be very close to the industry and explain the red lines and the restrictions, because AI is a technology that. Uh, we cannot put it in one box. We have to have different approaches, low risk, high risk, and prepare security criteria for anything that's coming up. So it develops, and we still don't know um, uh, where that line should be. So first we have to finish with the legislation. Then we have to be able to make um, to adapt and to be flexible. Uh, we have to be able to support and advise the, um, uh, the institutions by having an independent authority, authority actually that could like uh, risk alert them and um, they can set objective criteria that would apply uh, beyond uh, any member state uh, borders. So to monitor <coughs> that right. and also to promote it, it's needed uh, to have basically, and this is not easy and no, we don't have enough agencies to do that and independent <laughs> authorities. I think AI Okay. It's too big to let it go in the hands of the of the industry or the politicians. Uh, let's let's talk a few about a few concrete issues uh, regarding uh, AI because it's so hard to get your head around, really. Uh, and Bernd Stahl uh, over at uh, at, at Sherpa, uh, you are director of the Center for Computing and Social Responsibility at the University of Leicester, but you're also uh, director of of uh, of Sherpa, which is an EU funded project. Uh, for uh, five issues here, five scenarios: warfare. Uh, for instance, somebody disab uh, hackers disabling a power plant, inciting violence, education, robots in the classrooms, questions of privacy, of surveillance, self-driving cars, uh, about insurance, about movement tracking, uh, mimicking technologies, robots, holograms, uh, deception, and predictive policing, uh, discrimination, surveillance, privacy. Uh, the Minority Report, the Tom Cruise film, uh, might come might come to uh, to mind on that. Uh, about a lot of issues. Can you tell us one in which, uh, give us an example of how one of those should be regulated. Maybe we look at self-driving cars, for instance, which will, will be coming with, with uh, IoT, with the Internet of Things, with 5G. These are issues that are going to become increasingly real for all Europeans. Bernd. Okay, so, so the scenarios you've just mentioned, uh, they are scenarios that we developed in the Sherpa project uh, with a view to getting a feel for what AI and related technologies are likely going to look like in three, four, five years. So in the no, fairly short term future. Mm. Uh, we've also looked at uh, examples of cases which are already happening. So we've done uh, current case studies. Now, um, as you suggested, uh, there are lots of different issues that are worth uh, exploring. So with regards to autonomous vehicles, for example, uh, many of these have to do with safety and with liability. Yeah. So what many of those are actually uh, already well covered by current legislation around vehicles in general. So you know, uh, who is uh, or the question who's responsible for a malfunction of a car is one that will look slightly different uh, in autonomous vehicles, but is one that is uh, well trodden territory in, in the law. Um, and the work we're doing is trying to uh, pinpoint where exactly uh, new interventions are required, where current solutions are not sufficient. Um, and that's what the, the recommendations are about. Okay. Uh, among one of, uh, one of those uh, uh, reports that the European Parliament approved was a proposal to limit liability uh, to uh, 10 uh, million euros in the event of death and physical harm and 2, uh, mil uh, two million euros for uh, damage to property. Um, Eva, is, is that, isn't that, uh, for some people, that might not be enough? What do you think? We still have not even worked on the legislation, so um, we're not ready to... Uh, to be that specific. So what we're trying to do is to um, explore where we should move and how we can have, you know, it's very difficult to translate um, the rule of law and human rights respect into the digital era. So this is what we're trying to believe that we have to have transparency based, uh, principle based uh, legislation in order to get it right, because whatever is illegal online, it should be offline, whatever is offline, it should be online, so liability is the same. So we need to have clear rules and understand what about more specific measures. And I think what we definitely need to um, to make sure is that the um, the uh, applying oh. rule of law and uh, also by design, it has to happen with a, a scientific and technical understanding of how the technology works throughout the whole life cycle of AI. 
and not when harm happens. So we have to have transparency, we have to have safety checks in order to avoid talking about um, specific fees. But I, I do believe we can have like a range of that. But um, the first time, like two years ago, that we spoke about liability, let's blame the vehicle. Well, this is not the case. You, you have to make sure it's going to be clear who is them. Also, citizens need to yeah. have clear access to, to what happened, to the data, and to how the algorithm works, how the, the vehicle works. And what you mentioned before about insurance, deception, right. surveillance, and, and autonomous vehicles, right. this is exactly the high-risk AI that we have to um, uh, to care about even more and have more strict rules on. Bel Bel what, what is the guidance that you've uh, given uh, as far as recommendations uh, on, on liability uh, for self-driving cars or anything else? So we, we have not produced uh, recommendations specifically on liability. Um, in our recommendation around the development of a legislative framework, uh, we did say that this is a topic that needs to be covered. Mm. Um, I think uh, with regards to what Eva just said, namely the, the uh, question of risk assessment and uh, categorization of risk, I think there are uh, interesting questions to be asked, uh, how fine grained how detailed that has to be. So um, in, in many of the current proposals, there's a distinction between high risk and low risk. And uh, one of the questions we have is whether that is sufficient, uh, whether, uh, for example, physical safety uh, issues are the only ones that need to be considered under high risk or whether other risks uh, should be treated in a similar way. So, so um, no, no, these are all discussions that are still on ongoing. And I think the question of liability is, is a key one that will settle many of the ways in which we can deal with those technologies in future. Um, uh, Eva, um, regarding um, uh, a uh, what's called a design uh, ethics by design for researchers, that's one of the uh, other uh, recommendations uh, by uh, the, the the STEM project. By, sorry, by the uh, Sherpa project. Um, uh, what's what's your what's your feeling on that? On on setting that sort of guideline for researchers. So we already did that, uh, as I said again. To two years ago. Now we have to make it definitely binding by law because okay. uh, in Europe we don't need to uh, let things be blurry. We know exactly what we want to protect. We don't want to have discrimination or exclusion from an insurance company uh, using automated decisions. And it has to, I, I think the approach, we like the approach of the European Commission for uh, law to enhance the, um, um, the enforcement of the law when you're moving into more high risk applications. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's a good idea to have ethics officers basically to, to explain uh, and uh, as, as we have a data protection officer to, uh, to be able to give clear guidelines for the enforcement also of GDPR, um, I think we have to understanding of, um, of how the technology, one of the, the interesting things that happened to me during my last month, design, how to create trust by design, ethics by design, and I had some people working in the industry telling me that the, these things are not possible. If you're a politician that don't understand the algorithms and the technical um, uh, for AI, you believe that this is not possible. Well, it is actually possible to do it by design. What you have to make sure is that you don't try to fit everything in one box. You have different approaches for different applications uh, in order to avoid stifling um, innovation. So I would agree with that. And I think um, having like, um, maybe we can merge and align and come combine a role of, of uh, having an AI ethics officer or um, uh -huh. uh, officers yep. with human rights officers or like officers for uh, for businesses and data protection. So you think that that should be binding, that should be required of any company that and engages in AI? And we're working with this, just clear standards to be followed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bernd, in, in your discussions... Yes, but, but we can, yep. of course, have different sets of requirements yep. depending on the application. Indeed. Um, uh, Bernd, in, in, in your discussions uh, within uh, Sherpa, which includes uh, industry and, and, and researchers as well, uh, what's, what's the feeling there? Can you, can you expand on that, on this ethics by design? Because that, that's also been a consideration uh, with bioethics, too. With the genie out of the bottle, how do you regulate that? How do you get uh, companies to regulate that? Yes, so the idea behind ethics by design, and that is, uh, of course, aligned with existing uh, other types of by design, such as privacy by design, security by design. Uh, the idea there is to give people tools uh, that would allow them to think about the relevant issues early on. So in, in the, uh, just like we, uh, we've, we've known for a long time, if you try to bolt on security on a computer system after it's been developed, it 
typically doesn't work particularly well. Mm -hmm. um, so the earlier in, in the process of developing uh, you um, embed these considerations, the better. And what's the problem at the moment is that uh, it's not clear how best to do that. So it's not necessarily clear who should do it, at what stage of development should do it, and how it would integrate into existing methodologies of development. And ethics by design, as we propose it, would be a way that allows developers, that allows companies, uh, but it allows individuals, it would also allow public sector bodies who are developing and trying to make use of AI to find ways to integrate uh, ethical concerns within the methodologies they are already using. Uh, and, uh, let's turn to education, that uh, one of the other scenarios that you have that Sherpa looked at, robots in the classrooms, inequalities, surveillance, privacy, those are related issues there. And that's something that a lot of us are thinking about right now is uh, during, during COVID and a lot of people are doing home education. Um, what is the proposal there to ensure that AI uh, really does uh, help uh, students and, and uh, avoids uh, any uh, privacy issues? Uh, Eva, do you have any suggestions on that? Well, you know, we, we have already um, set up after um, a public um, discussion we had during the summer and under the light of, of the, the pandemic. So uh, we are trying to, Europe doesn't have the full competency on the educational That's program right. of, the, of the European member states. What we're trying to do is to call, um, to have AI assisted systems in Horizon Europe to make sure we will create uh, actually by design um, uh, the need to have AI training um, and guidelines for the Horizon Europe researchers and organizations. So I think um, basically we'll try to use more of the tools that we have to give more options and alternatives. Um, and um, I think um, one of the, of, the, of the words that here is very important for me is to give options. So everybody that, anybody that wants to be able to understand AI, to be able to do so, since we expect that most of the jobs in the near future will require digital skills or the gap will, will increase and we will have a uh, loss of jobs or we will not, we will not have the necessary um, supply. So um, I think that we need to, to fund research and we need to also make sure that we will create um, ethics for AI training and guidelines, as I said, for Horizon Europe. And I, I think this was actually the recommendation. Uh, Bernd, I think one aspect of, of education that I saw in those recommendations is that there be some sort of uh, human oversight, that, that, that humans be able to step in, that, that in, in an educational situation with AI. Can you elaborate on that and, and perhaps reassure us on that. Well, that's a uh, topic that is not just relevant to education. That's a, a general question of the level of autonomy that we would like to give to machines. Indeed. Um, this is very hotly debated in, in some uh, applications such as uh, autonomous weaponry, um, whether there always has to be a human who uh, in the end is responsible for pulling the trigger. That's right. But of course, similar questions arise in, uh, in educational environments as well. So would we want to leave um, grading, marking of, of exams, for example, to uh, machines? Hmm. Now, at this point, I think that there's a general uh, agreement that no, we wouldn't. No, the machines are probably not uh, reliable enough. But even if they were, uh, assessing the quality of other people's outputs is something that we typically see as a very human activity. So uh, this is something where I think there, there would not be a lot of appetite in the public uh, to leave this to an, an algorithm. Okay. What about and what about predictive policing, uh, Eva? Is there anything you could you could uh, add on that? Have you has your committee looked at predictive policing? Well, we are about to have like specific um, discussions on any aspect that could be of, of great concern, and yes, we did. It's also it has to do with like uh, profiling um, yeah. uh, citizens and mass surveillance. So these are uh, like all. Um, uh, meanings that we have to connect and understand what the implications should be. So um, during the contact tracing applications, we we had like a huge discussion about how to um, compromise uh, privacy for safety. Mm -hmm. And we decided we don't need to do that. We need to find ways to balance the two. So we need to uh, to be able to have safety and privacy in the same way we need to have like safety without predictive policing. What we can do uh, if we need to achieve this trustworthy environment and human-centric AI is to be able to use the technologies to complement what we already do. And I do believe that it's, a, it's very important to understand that if you have software and hardware that you give complete full automation, since we are humans, mistakes will happen because these AI systems are created by, by humans. They need to have um, 
human oversight. So I do believe that we're going to have a balanced approach in the end and we will not go do anything like 100%. percent we try to have it complementary to benefit citizens and to make sure we will use all these tools to achieve a more fair and trusted environment and not to create a Netflix a black mirror um, country. And we've seen how more authoritarian regimes are using technologies to achieve that. And we don't want to see that in Europe. Yes, in, indeed. That, that raises to me uh, another question about uh, export of, of artificial intelligence and uh, autonomous systems. I know there's a debate about uh, within the defense uh, establishment and defense industries. Uh, killer robots uh, is, is sort of an easy term, but uh, about autonomous systems, not only creating them here, but also exporting them. How do you control that belt? Well, we already have uh, export control restrictions for certain types of materials, so you, you can't just uh, export any sort of weaponry you would like. Um, but of course, that doesn't necessarily really address the issue. Uh, I think that there is sort of the, the bigger question in the first instance, uh, do we want autonomous weaponry at all? And th there is a, a large international community that is trying to stop them, to mm. ban them similar to the way landmines are banned. Um, but then uh, the, I think that there's a, that's a political question as to whether yeah. the EU, whether individual member states uh, would like to see this sort of weapon developed, whether they would like to deploy those weapons. Um, and then the question of what do we do with those weapons uh, as a follow on? Do we sell them on internationally? Who would we sell them on? Uh, I again think these are political questions that are not fundamentally different to, let's say, uh, selling battle tanks to other countries. I think the, 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 the sort of the moral lines of debate are very similar. Eva, did you want to weigh in on that? I mean, uh, that, that is a very, uh, a, a very difficult issue, really, to deal with. Because also, uh, we could have, uh, uh, Europe could have adversaries who do use that. And then what do you do? You have to be ready for that, right? Exactly. I actually had an amendment into the InvestEU file where I was saying, like, we should not be allowed to export technology that could, in the end, against a, a European member state. So we need to have stricter control and, and criteria. So uh, you could have like experts of the hardware, but you'd have to have full control of the electronic systems, especially when, uh, when we see member states being able to do their own uh, agreements. Um, and I think this is uh, an issue that we have to address because there is no European um, defense policy yet, actually. Each member state is making agreements to export. Of course, they have to pass through the European Union. They have to inform and they have to um, to be transparent about it, but we have to expand those complete autonomous weapons and losing control of this technology. Um, I, I do believe we will find uh, a consensus soon, and that's why we need to work with global organizations, mm -hmm. because these technologies, like once it's out there, it's very difficult to restrict it by not physical borders. Indeed. Uh, we only have a few minutes left here. Um, can, can we touch on, on the warfare, uh, disabling a power plant, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Belt, that was one of the uh, scenarios that you saw. What do we do about that? So, so the, the reason why we put this in the scenario and why, why we think it's interesting is that um, artificial intelligence and autonomous systems may raise new types of vulnerabilities, which we're currently not well prepared for. Um, so so the, the, the worry that um, adversarial actors would try to take over critical national infrastructure is not new at all, right? So we, we've always worried that somebody might try to take down a nuclear power plant or yeah. similar things. Uh, the, the, the question is whether AI and uh, related systems, whether they uh, create new vulnerabilities, what those vulnerabilities are, and how we would make sure that they cannot be exploited uh, by uh, such adversaries. Uh, so, uh, and I think the interesting point is that, well, at, at the moment, I think the, the, uh, a lot of national infrastructure is built on, on fairly simple technical uh, systems, uh, nothing as, as uh, complex as AI systems. Uh, but if we integrate such systems into um, critical infrastructure, then the question is how can we harden it? And uh, I think that is, a, to, to a large extent, that's an open question because we're still in the process of understanding what new vulnerabilities might be and how that would play out in practice. So, so it's, it's a key issue that needs to be addressed, but uh, I think um, technically and practically, this is something that needs to come along uh, in, in the near future. Indeed, there have been uh, countless uh, sci-fi horror films based on that. Uh, Eva, I guess that, that, that is, a, it's possible, right? How do you deal with that? What, what's the parliament thinking right now? So this is coming as a, a legislative report uh, by December. 
and we'll then work uh, uh, on that to mention energy grid or like um, water supply and also our online um, uh, exposure, not just the online, though, also offline uh, security of critical infrastructures. Right. Eva Kaili, Belchtal, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this very, very difficult issue and, and stay tuned for the developments uh, in the European Parliament as well as the European Commission on how to deal with that and on a global level. Uh, we have to look at how to coordinate efforts as well now that the genie is out of the bottle. Thanks for joining us and thanks for watching the European Business Summit. We'll, uh, stay tuned for the next, the next uh, seance.